Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service. Nisswa Tax Service offers tax preparation for individuals and businesses. Across from City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents, where this evening our topic is pressure in youth athletics. And if, if it's not for just kids to this program tonight, it's for grandparents and parents, anybody who's involved with youth and sports. I think we have a topic tonight that's going to hit home for a lot of people. Uh, I have a very distinguished panel here this evening, people who have been in this business for a long time, combined together. I, I'm probably afraid to ask how many years it's been. It's been a long time. But people have a lot of experience in the youth uh, teaching kids in sports. And um, I think you'll find this to be a very interesting topic tonight. To my immediate right is Tony Saylor, who is the director of the Brainerd Parks and Recreation Department. Hello, Ray. Tony's been doing this now, you said, for yeah, about 15 years, 15 but I years. believe you also have had coaching experience. Um, yeah. A little bit uh, in football and some uh, baseball. Yes. Okay. And to his right is, is a friend of mine. I've known John for 27, 28 years probably now, John Shoemaker, who is the athletic director and assistant high school principal in Park Rapids. That's correct, Ray. Thank you. And to his right is Mike Schmidt, who is the high school principal for the Staples High School and the Connection School which is an alternative high school in Staples, uh, giving students, I think, more technical kinds of training. School within a school, two high schools under one. So yep. I, I don't, I'm not sure how to define this problem, like, but we do know that we have a problem in sports uh, across the whole country. It's not unique to uh, Minnesota, and certainly it's, it's something that's happening everywhere. But a lot of us can go back to the 70s when some of us started coaching and some of us go, go back to the 80s. and. Uh, John, you probably have the most track experience here. Could you just give us a little perspective of how you see things have changed since you started coaching? And maybe you could tell us where you coached and a little bit about your coaching background. Well, I think the biggest change, Ray, was back when I started coaching in 83 in a small southern Minnesota school, Sleepy Eye St. Mary's. Um, at that time, you couldn't have contact with your kids as far as coaching them every day like you can now with the Minnesota State High School League rules. You can come June 1 with the high school league, you can get a coaching waiver, and you can coach your kids 24-7, seven days a week. There is a blackout period over the 4th of July, a seven-day period where you can't coach your kids. We couldn't do that back then, so kids would go to camps or kids would go work with their buddies and play together with their buddies and have a parent take them somewhere. There wasn't that pressure on with the kids. Back in 83 at Sleepy Eye St. Mary's, one of the biggest organized things we had was just our weight room and our condition that we brought our athletes in to prepare them. But as a coach, we couldn't do that. That changed in the mid-80s as well. We could come back and then you could coach your kids seven days a week to where it is now. And the pressure that's on the kids to be in sports and to be involved in teams and to specialize has grown and grown and grown so much more that the pressure for these kids has now not only at the high school level or the middle school level, it's now down in our elementary level for these kids to be involved in activities and to work and to specialize year round. So that's how it's changed. And the, it isn't just that we're doing more but the pressure to win at the lower grades is significantly different, isn't it? Correct. That's how success isn't now anymore. Did my son or my daughter go to a tournament and have a great experience and have fun and get to play with their friends? It's did my son or daughter go to this tournament and were they champions and were they winning? And if they're not, then it's not a good experience or then they didn't learn anything. And that's, that's the issue that I see in our youth sports. It's all about the wins and losses, not about what they learned. And who do you know in third or fourth grade if they're going to be your point guard or they're going to be your center and they're just tall, so go rebound. But they never handle the ball, but they never grow another inch. Tony, I think your perspective is probably unique in that you're not in the K-12 system. Correct. And you get an opportunity to have teams because you probably have a little bit of everything in the, in the summer rec program, basketball, baseball, I would guess, mm -hmm. just about everything. Is it different for the parks and recs in that there's not as much emphasis on winning as there is just recreationally playing? I think there's a big difference. Um, we keep telling people, this is summer recreation. Uh, I've told people, I said, the high school baseball coach is not here scouting your nine-year-old child. They're out here to have fun. They're out here to, have, uh, to learn. 
And uh, the parents, I think, really notice that and see that, that mm. this is just summer recreation that we're playing. Uh, the emphasis is to get better. It is not so much to win. Yes, winning is good. <clears throat> But I've always said that you learn a lot from losing as well. And I think that's an element that's kind of missing somewhat when you start seeing the travel teams and things like that, that we're in this, we're paying a lot of money, let's win, win, win. Where summer recreation that we run out of our program is it's more learning how to be a teammate, how, how to win, how to lose, um, how to play with someone that's not as good as you, you know, those type of things. Um, and the parents, I think for the most part, seldom do we have an issue with a parent at one of our parks. They're there to enjoy the game and have fun. Mike, what's your perspective? And I know you've coached in a number of different areas, probably. Coaching, yeah, and then in, as well as coaching, I've, I co I'm one of Tony's coaches in the summertime. I coach recreation. I've coached for school district programs and my own kids, other people's kids. And <laughs> I, <clears throat> now as a high school principal, I see the, the level of commitment is so different of what people are committed to and how. Um, and as a middle school teacher, I, I was surprised over tournaments that would begin on Thursdays and Fridays. And for a, for a student, it's a real mixed message on what's important five days a week. Is it your activities, your athletics, or is it your academics? And who's earned the right to be gone for two days? Is, is it the kid or is it the parents? And so I, I, I believe high school is about, is about habits. And I question sometimes the habits that we're instilling in our youth at a very young level where developmentally, are they ready to wrap their head around my program is year round or it does run every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or when we leave town, <clears throat> we're always gonna spend the night somewhere. Those are pretty high expectations to put on the youth of today when they kind of only know what they're shown. And uh, yeah, things are, I agree with what these guys have already said. One of the things that has changed the, the game significantly was the introduction of AAU sports. And I'm sure a lot of our viewers don't know what that is. Could somebody help us understand what AAU is and how it differs from the traditional role that the high school coaches play? Anybody want to tackle that one? Well, I think it's not just singled out to AAU. That's one division. I know they focus a lot like on basketball and, and some of the other sports. But I think for the most part at the, the lower grade levels, especially under grade nine, when you're talking the weekend tournaments or year round, if there's an empty gym or an empty field, it's going to be filled with something. And so I think AAU is uh, just one representation of how things have gotten away from seasonal athletics. Well, what is it? What is AAU? Can you kind of give us a nutsh a quick well, snapshot I guess, of it? I guess what I would say AAU is when it first for it was formulated, and I had the very distinct pleasure of, of uh, coaching a very elite athlete, and Janessa Wolf went on to Penn State um, and played there, and she played AAU. And what it is, what it started out to be was a coach or a group of coaches that would gather a group of elite athletes or, or very talented athletes, and you would go and you would play at what I consider national type events. So it wasn't, it wasn't going to be from Park Rapids and bringing seven kids and go to play at Staples and play kids from Brainerd or whatever. It was bringing your elite group of kids together, p playing them, forming them, and then they would go to national tournaments to gain recognition. And like Mike said, it's just not AAU, that's kind of the basketball. We can look at J.O. Volleyball now which has kind of taken the same thing. J.O.? Yep, Junior Olympics is what, what J.O. starts. Or we can take hockey, and they go to what they call the elite leagues. And it's the gathering of the, some of the best players from either regions in the state or the areas. They, they come together, they practice, and then they go. Well, when Janessa was first starting, was doing this, and she graduated from Park Rapids in 2007, there was like two or three levels of AAU basketball where there would be just groups of kids that would go there. It could be a team in Bemidji. I know she played that when she was younger in 7th, 8th, and ninth grade. And then she went down and played on a team out of the cities. Those were that. What I'm seeing now is that the age of those has lowered. So now there's AAU, JO for 14U, 12U, 10U. So now that's gone lower. And now they're also competing during the time of other sports. So... J.O. Volleyball has just now starting to kick in in some communities. Well, we still got these kids playing basketball. We still have, in hockey, the elite hockey, and I understand it, I get it, 
they'll play a football game if you're an elite hockey player on elite league. They made you play a football game on Friday night, and then you'll travel down to the cities Friday night to play Saturday Sunday, hockey in hockey in wow. the fall. And it's and it's it's multi leveled It's multi tiered. It's not just for the elite. Wow. And it's giving kids opportunities. I you know I had a discussion with them. It's an opportunity for him to improve, to play with other kids. But okay, I get that, and I agree with that to a point. But when does he get to be a kid? I mean, I believe all of us here, all four of us here, are fishermen. We're kind of somewhat outdoorsmen. We've had been able to take our kids and our families and go do things. When do you get to do that? And how many kids do you see now that are three sport athletes in our mm -hmm. high schools? I think as an athletic director, when I had that role, and even now as the principal, I I'm I can't emphasize enough to students that when when and if the college does call, if you will. The questions they ask are, is a great student? Are they a good student? Um, what are they like in your school, you know, demeanor? What was the rigor of their coursework? But are they, what other activities are they in? And it's a, it's a, it's a strong message from, from the finish line, I think, to families that it, they're looking for diverse kids. And I think the, the, the pressure to choose as a family, I think that's one of the things in how sports have, uh, athletics have changed at a younger age level. As a family, you go all in on these things. I mean, like, this is what we're going to do as a family. And I question sometimes if, if where does the identity go in that as a kid? And I know my own kids through, through our programs, I've, I've had basketball players, I've had wrestlers, I've had hockey players, I've had uh, taekwondo kids, I've had, and, and I'm speaking to my son, and he's 12. He's still trying stuff out. And he's had great experiences, but we've kept that open mind of what, you know, what do you want to try? So, and, yeah. One of the <clears throat> themes I think that we hear through the media in the, in the modern world is we have more and more adults trying to live their athletics through their children. And I'm talking about really young children. Uh, mm -hmm. I was out of state last week and I went to a basketball game with eighth grade girls. And this one girls team had three coaches. And the three coaches were hollering through this whole game. It sounded like, you know, a high school senior game. And, and these are little kids that, you know, they're eighth graders. My gosh, they were so small. And it, it has to take the fun out of the game for kids to be dealing with that kind of a pressure when they're eight and nine and ten years old. They're still trying to decide if they even like that game. And i got to believe that when they're being hollered at at that level, it takes the fun out of even liking it. But... The other aspect of this is how many kids really get to go on to be college players and how many get to go on to be at a level that's higher than that. It's a very, very small percentage. So it seems like our society is kind of getting a twisted view of the importance of these lower level events. Anybody ever want to respond to that? Well, you know, I see uh, in our summer programs, like our, say our Bronco League, which is nine and 10 year old. Uh, uh, or 11 and 12 year old baseball players. There's 80 of them in the league. By the time they get to the varsity level, there might be four of them left. Now, how many of those go on to college? Might be one, maybe two. Um, so the, it, it pairs down really fast. And I guess one of the things I look at, looking back on when I was playing um, in the 70s in high school and stuff, everybody played three sports. When one season got over... In a smaller then, school. Yes. The next season started. and. And uh, I see in summer programs now where kids will miss baseball for a full week. Well, where are you? I'm at a hockey camp all week. I have to go or I don't have a chance to make the team. Or it's volleyball or it's wrestling or it's whatever. Where some of the sports are grabbing these kids and saying, mm. you must go to this sport. And like Mike kind of alluded to, how do you know that your sport when you're 9 or 10 years old is going to be the one you excel at? And that's why I think that kids should be in a lot of different sports when they're younger and see which ones you like, which ones you might be good at. Don't make that decision when you're 9 or 10 years old because if you're not good at it and now you're a freshman, well, now what are you going to do? You're behind five years behind everybody else. You know, so I think I run into that problem a lot. Do you guys see any of that at all? Or I, I have to say, you know, when I coach summer parks and rec, I am reminded every summer that some kids at the end of the game – just want to know who brought the treat. And one of the best dugout arguments I was ever a part of was the 
Hot topic of what is better, Gatorade or Powerade. And those, <laughs> that was a group of nine and ten year old boys. And I think that simplicity of, of athletics is, is getting complicated by a financial responsibility to families. I, I question all the time how do families afford it. To, to, if you choose some that are year-round and, and weekends and tournaments, and, and I'm all for families spending time together how they want to spend time together, but I, I think of the financial fatigue and, again, the model that's, that's been laid out in front of families. I don't know if families knew at the end what they knew at the beginning if they would go about it the same way. I, I often wonder if things have just gotten out of hand and now it's become the new normal with athletics. I think you really make a good point, Tony, and and I know in my coaching career I used to see 18, 17, 7th graders playing basketball, and at the end when there were juniors or seniors, there's three of them left. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of those weren't athletes, and so they probably didn't really belong at that level, obviously, but some of them were, mm -hmm. and they quit for a variety of reasons, which is kind of a sad thing to see, that somebody could have had a, I look at basketball and hockey as almost lifelong sports. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of people like to play them when they're older. So I think that has been a, a huge observation I've, of mine. I've talked to some kids when they're, a lot of um, teenagers work in our department. And I say, well, why did you quit? Well, I got burned out. And I think that means the pressure got too great on me or whatever. Um, and that's what I, I'm fearful when it's you play one sport and you, you go to all these camps and all these weekend tournaments and this and that. After a while, you don't, like someone, John, I think you said earlier, you don't get to be a kid anymore. Um, to me, summers were play some baseball, go swimming, go fishing, clown around. Um, and one other thing that we kind of look at is when we were kids, we went out and played sandlot ball. We just made up a game in the backyard. Mm -hmm. right. Now the kids, our fields during the day are empty. Their kids aren't out there because... It seems like the kids can only do things if the parents are sitting there watching them. Oh, really? And I think that has really yeah, hurt a lot of things. Um, I know that I always look back at I never played travel ball. It wasn't invented back then. Right. We just played ball um, in a league, and we played ball in the backyard. I will guarantee you that we knew the fundamentals much more than the kids of today. We sat and watched baseball games on TV. We'd watch the Twins. We knew who our heroes were. We would emulate them out in the backyard. A lot of kids, you ask, who's your favorite twin? And they're like, I don't know. Um, you get that sometimes. Wow. And uh, it's just kind of, it's kind of scary how it's changed from just being, it's, it's a game. People forget that it's a game. And uh, sometimes the pressure being put on these kids is that it's no longer a game. It's a, we're putting a lot of money into this. You better win or you better excel. It seems like the uh, in, uh, yeah, um, advent, I guess, of athletic fees to participate in sports really kind of was a game changer too, wasn't it, mm -hmm. in our lifetime? Right. A lot more parents figured if we're going to pay three or four hundred dollars, they better play. And that and that's what parents are are weighing their what success is. It's the playing time, and I get that part. You know, I get that component. It's, it's a participation fee. It's not a playing fee. You're not guaranteed playing time with it. But at Park Rapids High School, it's $150 to play a varsity sport or a high school sport, 9 through 12. I understand that when that parent says, I'm paying 150 bucks and my kid's only getting, you know, in a sport like at basketball where you can only put five kids on the floor at a time, only getting five minutes a game or is, may not be getting any more as you elevate to the levels, to the different levels. And... What I found out is we've lost the part, the component of being part of something is special. Mm -hmm. Being part of a team and being a great teammate and learning those life skills, we've lost that because the pressure to win, or as Mike said, the financial part of what I'm paying. Not only to the high school, but all the way through. A great example, we talk about pressure on our kids. I remember when I was the head girls basketball coach at Park Rapids. And I brought my senior in, who was a great young lady, and it was during the probably first two weeks of school. This young lady was also a volleyball player. She was also a, um, a softball player. So well, how, how was your summer? Did you have a great summer? You had a great summer in the gym. And all of a sudden it was like she kind of teared up on me, and she said, shoot, it was awful. 
I didn't want to let down my volleyball coach. So I had to figure out how I could be in the gym two days a week or three days a week with her. I didn't want to let you down. That was two or three days a week. And thank goodness I had a good relationship with our volleyball coach. So we tag teamed it so it was only two days. But then, she had a, then we worked around softball, which was a great softball and a captain of all three. And then today she had to help her parents and she had to work. Wow. And so try to be a multi-sport, fulfill the desires of all three coaches here, but then also be a kid. And I re that really struck me that I didn't think I was putting pressure on the kid, but what she felt what was the pressure was the pressure to keep everybody <clears throat> happy, but she wasn't happy. Uh, I don't want to put any of you in a position of talking about your home <clears throat> school and your home parents, but obviously the parent pressure is a lot different today too than it was 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, there's been, in the metro area in the last couple of years, parents getting into fights, uh, really serious ones. Are you seeing more of that in, on your travel, when you're, as you travel through schools? Are you seeing more irate parents? Or is that, uh, the, the high school league has really emphasized sportsmanship the last uh, X number of years. W what are you seeing out there? I believe that the State High School League has really taken, first of all, a needed and necessary approach. But when you look at the vocabulary they're using of their expectations, it's very primary and very early developmental mentality and, and messages about sportsmanship, uh, doing the right things on the court. Uh, when, when you think of the heroic stories in sports right now or the the, the ones who help another uh, a competitor cross the finish line because her ankle got twisted or carried her across home plate. Those are the stories that shouldn't be the stories at the end of their high school or 18-year-old athletic career. So I think what's interesting is the high school league has come in with messages. And <clears throat> my perspective isn't mine. It was one that was shared with me. Just have they, have they had to re- <laughs> <clears throat> reassess how things got where they are and the messages that should have been delivered at a younger age were having to finish differently. Um, and I think it just goes, you know, again to where it's starting so much sooner. And I think the pressures on parents are, are when somebody mentioned about supporting and going to watch your kid. When I coached junior high athletics, we would take three buses of football players to Bemidji to go play Bemidji with Brainerd football. And we used to tell parents almost, don't, don't go to this away game. It's just, we have too many kids and we're gonna, they're gonna see seconds we would see a handful of parents at those games. And that was back when gas was cheaper and so forth and so on. Now I go to watch my seventh grade son and almost every parent is there. And I still believe as a coach, some of that child's experience, my own son, is to get on the bus with his lunch, to do his homework in the dark, if you will, and experience those sights and smells of a seventh grade bus that are very, very one of a kind, if you will. And I just, I feel like the pressure on the parents, if I'm not there, I'm not supporting. And as a coach, I don't know about you guys, but kids sometimes are more at ease when there's less eyes on them. We're down to our last four minutes. There's a path forward out of this. Um, not that we are here today to, to give it, <laughs> that we're so knowledgeable. But there's a couple articles that I've read about this, and I just wanted to get your reaction to it. Uh, what we can do to sort of mis uh, redirect these energies to help kids focus on excellence at the younger grades and not on winning. And a couple of things this writer says is start letting your kids compete with other kids like you used to as a child and stop competing with other adults through your kids. Stop worrying about winning and find better ways to measure the success of your child's sports program. And say something positive. Do something different with kids and help them understand their role in their team as a little person. And his advice to coaches, for those of you who are doing it right, developing athletes and teaching them about sports and life, keep doing what you're doing. In the last three minutes that we've got, would any of you like to comment about those concepts this writer has? You know, let me point out something that my high school coach told me um, back in Purim. Uh, his name was Bob Okowski. Our senior year, we were probably the worst class that ever went through Purim High. Um, we were 0-9 in football. We won two games in basketball, and the only team we beat hadn't won a game in three years. Many years later, I asked him, I said, what did you think about our team? And he said, you know, you guys seldom won, but you always showed up, and you always practiced hard. 
He said, I knew you people were going to be successful. Isn't that the truth? Because we learned that even when the going's tough, you kept going and putting the putting the, the pads back on and stuff. And I, that has stuck with quit. me. We never quit. And he knew we were going to be successful because we just didn't go, oh, I'm not going to play for this team. They're, they're a bunch of losers. No, we kept trying and trying and trying. That has always stuck with me. Wow, good stuff. Yeah, I think, you know, there's so much that you can learn from not from not just being winners as far as the record goes. Just the skills, the working together, the, the sportsmanship, helping each other up. Skills that take you far beyond in your life that we now sometimes miss because we didn't win. Or the thought of in fourth and fifth grade you beat that team. How come you didn't beat them as seniors? Well, things change. Kids change. And those lessons we need to learn at that younger age to make that you know later on in life be successful. Mike doesn't have anything to say. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I think I would encourage families that when they do, when, when everything stops and the chaos stops and you're not eating another taco in a bag or it's not another hot dog night in the gym, think of how you're all feeling as a family and don't lose sight of that. Sometimes what you think you're supposed to do on Saturday morning may not be the best thing. Take time because I, we all have... You know, our kids are all growing and, and they grow fast, and they're years and, and moments you can't get back. And don't spend them all on one track, would be my advice. That's good, healthy advice from very knowledgeable people who I respect greatly, all three of the things that you guys have done. Thank you for taking the time to come on our show, and hopefully, we've helped some parents keep some of this in perspective when their kids are in athletics. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thanks, Ray. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow, so long until next time.